We were hoping to... ¿Me escuchas? <laughs> bien. Perfecto, gracias. Ahí bien. Hola, hola. ¿Me escuchan? Creo que ahí más bajito.
the control is 940 and the, and the reception <laughs> is less than that. No, at the end he was starving, he went for dinner. Yeah. And it was like too late. I mean, I I, I was always looking forward to it. I mean, I mean yeah. it's, it's just really, really Hola, eh, muy buenos días. Eh, good, oh, good morning. Buenos días. Good morning. And welcome uh, to this round table in which we will reflect on the future of higher education and the role that teachers play in the construction of that future. And in so doing, in recasting the future of the profession, that of teachers and, and higher education personnel. Um, uh, allow me to, to, welcome, to welcome our panelists and all participants present in this room. And also uh, to say a word to thank uh, the team of the World Conference on Higher Education for, for providing us with, with copious opportunities for the discussion on teachers. We had a panel yesterday we heard from Education International. For information, there will be another panel, which will be the continuation looking into the future of uh, the teaching profession and, and higher education personnel this afternoon at 2.30 in room two in this very building. So we're very grateful for the organizers of the World Conference of Higher Education for, for these opportunities to discuss a very important topic, which is the challenges uh, that, that higher education teaching personnel face today, but also how we can empower and engage them in the transformation of education, looking into the future, one that looks at the aspirations that we have for education uh, as depicted in the Futures of Education report <coughs> excuse me, that we published um, last year. I would also like to thank the ILO and the colleagues contributing to the organization of this roundtable. My name is Carlos Vargas and I, I lead the section for teacher development at UNESCO and the Secretariat for the International Task Force on Teachers for Education 2030 and it will be my pleasure to moderate this panel today. So today we have a panel which is very rich in terms of personalities and in terms of perspectives. Let me introduce you to Ms. Susan Hopwood. She is both the President of Education International and the Federal Secretary of the Australian Education Union. Thank you, Susan, for joining us. Thank you, Carlos. We also have Mr. Glenford Howe to my left who is actually uh, a member of the CERT. As you know, the CERT is the joint committee of experts on the application on the recommendations concerning uh, teaching personnel, uh, which is a committee that, is, that, that monitors actually the implementation and the application of this, uh, of this recommendation. And he's also uh, a senior researcher at the University of the West Indies open campus in Montserrat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, we have Mr. Jose Castiano to my right. He is the Vice Rector of the Universidad de Pedagogica de Maputo uh, in Mozambique. Uh, obrigado. <laughs> and we also have, um, to my left, we have Ms. Keishia Thorpe. She is, uh, she has been named, uh, she has been the winner of the Global Teacher Prize of, uh, of, the, of the Barkey Foundation. Uh, and she's also an English teacher to 12th grade students at the International High School Langley Park in the USA. Uh, besides her engagement as, as a teacher and having a teacher voice in the panel, she is also an advocate and a promoter of inclusion in higher education by helping uh, high school students for, from, from immigrant and disadvantaged communities to actually uh, access higher education in a, in, in a somewhat competitive environment. Thank you for joining us, Keishia. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Oliver Liang to my left. He is the head of the private and public services sectors unit of the International Labor Organization. Uh, he co-coordinates the joint ILO UNESCO committee of experts on the application of the recommendations concerning teaching personnel. And he also has been engaged in the development of 
social dialogue, social dialogue frameworks for the participation and, 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 the, and the collective bargaining of, of, of uh, teacher organizations, but also in the development of policy guidelines, including for early childhood education personnel. Thank you very much, Oliver, for joining us. Uh, before I give the floor to our, to our panelists, maybe uh, a, little, a little word just to, to, frame, to frame the panel, coming from the conversations that we, that we started yesterday in, in this panel that, that, that Education International organized, uh, which speaks of the importance of uh, reinventing, rethinking, and reimagining the higher education teaching profession. Uh, we have seen uh, in the past 10 years at least, and since, uh, since the last World Conference on Higher Education, we've seen that uh, higher education has undergone, has undergone profound changes in terms of uh, societal need. Thank you. Uh, and, and these challenges uh, have to do very much with uh, demographic change and the pressures that there have been for uh, higher education. There's, there's a growing demand for higher education with beginning with the universalization of primary and the progression into secondary uh, education globally. And this global, this global demographic pressure also has come together with issues that challenge education today. Issues around, for example, conflict, environmental sustainability, poverty, and inequality. So education is called to respond to these challenges, and the role that teachers play in responding to them is paramount. 25 years ago, UNESCO launched a recommendation concerning the status of higher education teaching personnel, and 25 years down the road, it is still current, it is still valid, and it still tries to protect some of the rights and the freedoms of the teaching profession, it still needs to set standards for the professionalism from the terms of security, of employment, working conditions, but also academic freedom and institutional autonomy. These issues around academic freedom and institutional autonomy are some that we heard last October when we had the past session of the, of the CERT. Uh, and we heard also allegations about the violations of academic freedom and institutional autonomy, for example. And other allegations concern the reduced financing and investment in public education, in national universities, and the effect that this has had on the instability of the working conditions of higher education teaching personnel. In addition, trends such as massification, the growing privatization, technological advancements, changing patterns in funding and in labor markets characterize higher education today. We've seen, uh, however, uh, with the COVID-19, the pandemic has amplified these developments through closures of higher education institutions, limited mobility, shrinking enrollment, and the challenges of the digital transformation of education. We have seen during the pandemic how working conditions and salaries decreased and workloads intensified. Many teachers lost their employment, some of them lost their lives to COVID-19, and this uh, is to be remedied. Uh, as you may recall, the Futures of Education report of UNESCO, which was published at the end of last year, uh, calls for a new social contract for education. And this social contract certainly includes the commitment, the renovated commitment of member states, of education systems, of employers all together to improve the working conditions on higher education teaching personnel, on the contractual, on the salary, on the social standing, on the appreciation that teachers have uh, socially, uh, but also on the autonomy, the agency, the freedom that they, they need in order to perform their works and duties. So to discuss the challenges that we have heard from yesterday that COVID had on higher education teaching personnel, uh, but also to look into the future, uh, we have uh, set 
this panel. And uh, maybe let me start by, by asking a question to Susan, please. Susan, uh, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted working and teaching conditions of university staff, including administrative and support personnel? And what policies are needed to improve the employment and working conditions of higher education teaching personnel to empower them to transform the profession and higher education altogether? Well, um, thanks, uh, Carlos, and good morning, everybody. And, and thanks also for the framing um, of this discussion that you've just made. In higher education, uh, of course, when the pandemic hit, teaching and learning activities were very rapidly moved um, online in most countries, and teaching staff were forced to transform their whole practice in a matter of days. Pedagogies had to be adapted for remote learning, and educators had to quickly acquire skills in digital technologies so that the education of our students could continue. These, um, you know, many educators reported struggling with the technology, being worried about their students and the quality of learning, and, and also the lack, the, the, the lack of support that they were provided at the time. The, the changes and adaptations led to an increase in the volume of the professional work done by academic staff, and in many cases, the extra hours teaching staff had to work were not compensated. Time allocated for research has been severely limited by the increase in the teaching workload. And this trend was not confined to the first year of the pandemic. Of course, it continued and continues now. The crisis also increased stress levels right across the profession. Teachers found themselves in situations which were quite unrealistic and constantly changing, and with the constantly changing demands, with little guidance, peer support or contact, and greater uncertainty about students' effective engagement. Colleagues in administrative and support personnel roles have faced a higher degree of job and income security as a result of the pandemic. These positions have been casualised for many years, <coughs> and many colleagues lost income when higher education institutions closed their doors and moved online. The pattern of reducing staff on fixed term or contract or casual contracts in conjunction with not replacing, retiring or resigning staff has intensified during the pandemic and resulted in severe staff shortages and, of course, increased workload. One aspect I would like to flag is the gendered impact of the pandemic on higher education. During lockdowns, female workers have faced a sudden and exponential increase in their professional, domestic and care responsibilities. And we need to pay particular attention to this because this is the sector of education where women are already underrepresented, especially in higher academic ranks. The pandemic is setting us further back on this front and this requires immediate action. Now, what do we do about it? Well, first of all, in order to affect real positive change for the future of higher education, we need to recognise that many of the issues that came to the fore during the pandemic existed long before COVID locked down the world. In many ways, the pandemic is a wake-up call for us all. Now we have the opportunity to reverse some of the negative trends plaguing higher education for decades, and we need to make sure that we seize this opportunity. The crisis has shown us that we need to rethink our whole funding model for higher education. The sustained pressure on universities to generate their own rev revenue is accelerating and exacerbating privatisation trends. And it negatively impacts on teaching and learning conditions and leads to, of course, increased inequality for students and staff. Promoting decent work should be at the core of any roadmap, roadmap for a new era on higher education. It is crucial to building strong higher education systems that will help us achieve the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and address the biggest challenges of our times. One critical problem that needs to be arrest, addressed as a matter of urgency is the casualisation of academic labour. We've seen a considerable increase in the number of precarious staff and the consequences of that have become painfully obvious during the pandemic. Staff shortages are another consequence of this catastrophic funding model. Staff levels have not kept pace with increasing student numbers and as a consequence, student to staff ratios have been increasing each year. The teacher work workload has increased and this situation is not conducive to quality learning. We do need to remember that higher education support personnel are critical. 
and to the functioning of all higher education institutions, and investment in recruiting in this area must be a priority. And we must also strengthen social dialogue and collegial governance structures that have been undermined for years as more and more power shifted to university managers. As long as staff is not consulted and engaged in decision making, their working conditions, their terms of employment, but also the quality of education will suffer. And I'd also like to make a final point about academic freedom, which we all know is a central professional right of higher education and research staff. Without academic freedom, Higher education cannot serve the public interest. It cannot promote critical thinking and inquiry, and it cannot serve democracy. We've seen academic freedom under attack in many countries, with academics facing direct political interference and even persecution. These are well-known and obvious violations that must be denounced and combated. But we also shed light on more subtle threats. Casualisation and F academic freedom are closely interlinked. Also, collegial governance is critical for academic freedom. Finally, the dominance of digital technologies raises many serious issues for academic freedom. We need to reflect on how we can work to protect and strengthen uh, academic freedom across all contexts, online and offline. All these issues are critical to achieving a quality, inclusive higher education for a sustainable future. And as Carlos has already um, mentioned, but let me put in another plug, later today we will have an in-depth discussion on this very topic. Uh, what would it take to have a well-supported, qualified and motivated workforce in higher education? So I'm hoping that you will be able to join us for this important conversation at 2.30 this afternoon in this building. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Now, uh, Susan has mentioned some of the transformations that, that higher education underwent as of the COVID, but also of the opportunity that the, these educational disruptions provided us with in order to rethink, to reshuffle, to reimagine education, the very purpose of it, the forms of organization of learning, uh, the pedagogies, the forms of engagement that are also, that are also new. Uh, now, let me turn to, to, to Glenford, uh, maybe to discuss also how the pandemic also brought changes to, to, to the need for new pedagogies, for new forms of engagement. What are some of the, the changes uh, and the implications that they have uh, in teaching practice, in professional development from a perspective of a uh, university in particular, in the Caribbean, in Montserrat? Thank you, Carlos, and um, I must admit up front that I've taken the liberty to sort of redefine the questions that you've uh, presented, right? Uh, Susan has done an excellent job in outlining the broad impacts of COVID on higher education institutions, I think, globally. Um, so what I want to do today is to, and the issues that she raised are issues that we deal with um, um, with this, this year, for which I'm, I'm the rapporteur, but today I want to speak about the impact more on a particular institution. Um, we cannot assume that the impact is even on all institutions, even those within the, the developed or developing um, world. So I'm going to look at the, just say something very briefly about the University of the West Indies. Um, we were established in 1948 um, as part of uh, the offspring of the University of London, um, as part of the British efforts to rectify the problems with social and economic developments across the Caribbean region. Uh, when we started, we had 32 students. All of them were medical students. Um, today, we have uh, five campuses, and we have uh, 50, about 50,000 students, and um, about 8,000 staff members, faculty and, and, and staff. Um, in 2017, 2017, we decided to to try to enter the global rankings to see how well we were doing as a, as a university. And when we entered, we, we were, at that point, we were in the, in 2018, we were ranked in the top 1% of universities in Latin America and the Caribbean, the top 1% of golden age universities, universities 50 to 80 years uh, old, and top 4% of universities worldwide. And we wanted to move into the top 3% by 2023. However, in the 2021-22 rankings, um, we have actually moved to be within the top 1.5% of universities um, worldwide from a field of about 30,000 um, uh, elite universities and research institutes around the world. 
as part of the, the Times Higher Education Global Ranking System. Now, we have had a history of, of um, overcoming a lot of struggles, a lot of problems, um, and our Vice Chancellor, uh, his position is that our approach to these disruptions have been radical rethinking, um, being steps ahead of them in order to remain responsive and relevant to the needs of our stakeholders. So, you know, everybody in the Caribbean has a place of, of beauty. Um, a lot of tourists like to come there. But not much is said about the devastating impacts of hurricanes that we get almost every year. Sometimes a hurricane could devastate an entire country, um, an entire island, and, and that would be very, really bad for the institutions which exist on the particular island. Um, so we deal with that. Then we also operate in a, a, an environment of very scarce um, financial resources. So many of the 17 Caribbean countries uh, which contribute to the financial upkeep of the university, they themselves struggle with heavy debt burdens um, for, us, so for the past three decades or so. We have very supportive governments, um, but about 25 years ago, so we were told in no uncertain terms that we had to reduce our dependence on, on governments. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the governments, were, or some of the governments in Jamaica, Trinidad, and Barbados were also establishing national universities. Um, you know, so, and we as the University of the West Indies, we are a regional university to cover the entire, the entire CARICOM space. So we have actually reduced our dependence from about 90% down to 45%. Um, so we get our income from some from student fees, um, the contributions of government, and also our entrepreneurial activities. Um, that in itself is a, a, a remarkable um, achievement, I think. Um, we've also had to deal with um, our, our annual operating budget is about US 500 million. Um, but we're required to then not only to fulfill all the, 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 ma the various mandates which we have from the Caribbean governments, but we have to produce um, top quality research, um, teaching, and, and, and so forth. Now, in the beginning, I said every, a lot of people assume that, you know, that the impact of COVID is sort of even across universities, maybe in the developing world, but not, not exactly. Um, prior to COVID, we were already uh, making a number of, of of initiative, undertaking a number of initiatives, which would have a, a significant um, impact, I think, or influence on the way COVID impacted us. Um, we had to reimagine re our university, and we were now branding ourselves as a, a sort of activist university, which really meant greater alignment of industry and academia, the expansion of access in tertiary education, and agility to, to global opportunities. And in concrete terms, what some of this meant was really establishing closer alignment with national and regional development plans, the various governments, and also with the, the sustainable development goals. So we try to get right in the mix of everything. The, one of the implications of, of this uh, initiative is that we had to undertake um, <coughs> a significant reforms within our finances, our efficiency, administration, governance, um, innovation, and just trying to reposition ourselves to be one of the key engines of growth for, for the region as a whole. So we, under, we also undertook a rebranding and a reputation improvement exercise and a revenue generation exercise. And that's about from 2015, 2016, when we had a new vice chancellor enrolled, um, so hello Rebecca. And um, so it's, it's like a major acceleration of uh, initiatives which were already some of them are already um, in place prior to 2015, 2016, but um, he took it to a, a new level altogether after the, after the time. We established about 10 global centers um, in China, um, Africa, and in Europe, different places. And this again would also have implications for how COVID impacted us. Uh, we also established, in, in 2008, we established a global campus, uh, open campus, to handle all of our online education um, deliveries. And we're now in the process of transitioning that into a sort of a global campus. Um, we also had to look at what sort of graduates that we were reproducing, we were producing for, for the region and, and, and globally. And we wanted our graduates to be more aware of the environment um, so that they were more prepared for any eventuality that would affect their future or the environment in which they operate, their function. Uh, we wanted them to be uh, aware of global events and to be knowledgeable and open-minded and willing to contribute to political, social, economic, and environmental and cultural issues nationally, regionally, and, and um, globally. 
And then finally, what, one of the things that they did, we really ramped up our relationships with a number of universities across, across, the, across the globe. We, um, there were a university, we have an organization called Universities Caribbean. So we have similar institutions, universities, Australia, universities, UK. And we, at the moment, we, we lead that particular organization. But we also, we had hundreds of MOUs with universities across the world. Um, we took a very close look at, at each and every one of them and to look to see whether they were actually working, whether they were benefiting the university. And we, we attempted not to start to redefine these relationships, have new MOUs or cancel the ones which weren't working. And as we also started to look to see what new, other new relationships and partnerships we needed to establish in order to, to strengthen our, our, our university now. In terms of the, the COVID-19 and, it, and its impact, our Vice Chancellor has noted um, that the COVID-19 pandemic for us is not a game changer, but a super accelerator. Our thoughts and strategies preceded 2020, the 2020 catastrophe. Um, one of the things, remember I mentioned that we had established centers in China, um, and that really worked in our favor because in many, many weeks before the, the, the first case of COVID appeared in the Caribbean, we already had intelligence about the possibility that this could be major and that it would impact us. So what we did, um, we established a, a COVID-19 task force very, very early in the game. And that task force had the responsibility to get the university ready for when the first cases um, started to appear in, in, in the Caribbean. But also not the institution itself, but also the wider society. So we were very um, involved with the, our, our public health system, um, a whole, all the systems, economic systems, everything, to ensure that the impact was mitigated when it actually, and, and I think we have done um, very, very well um, in terms of the, the, the overall impact of COVID on the university and the impact on the wider society, just by being very agile and taking actions very, very early. Um, one of the things that we also did was to ensure that we moved, um, I think Susan said in a matter of days, in some cases, some universities had to move their, their classes online. Well, we had many, many weeks to prepare. And what we did, we had, as I said, we had an open campus, which was doing a lot of our de delivering of, of courses online. So what we did, we mobilized the open campus to leverage their expertise in training staff from the, the land of the physical campuses um, in, in, in delivery and providing counseling. We also used the open campus with its expertise to begin to prepare students very early for what, what would happen. Um, these are the things that they, they, they should expect um, and how teaching and learning would, would change for everybody, not just those who are doing online, online education. Right, yeah, I'll finish now. <laughs> um, of course, a, a lot of those things, um, we, had, we, we had a major challenge too, in the sense that we, I think most of you know about neo-managerialism neo and you know, the whole emphasis that as soon as anything happens, the, the business people, are always quick to say, but you know, we should do something to make sure that the university is operating differently, um, control spending and, and so forth. But our, our university took the decision, yes, we would take on board all of these things and we would refine our, our financial operations and so forth. But one of the things that the university decided very early is that it had a commitment, not just to its students, and to stay and ensure that the students got the best education throughout the pandemic. We also felt that we had a commitment to our staff, faculty and staff. And so therefore, we, we have basically shunned um, the, the worst types of, uh, of, of well, we placed emphasis on frugality. But we, we absolutely did not engage in any laying off of staff and the, the worst type of, of things that the, the private sector would, would have wanted us to do. And at the end, I think we've come out a much better university uh, of course, there are certain things that, the, that COVID did also. Um, for example, you know, there's a lot of discussion now about the right to disconnect, and it's, a, it's an issue that we should be discussed in the, in the SEAT also. And it really pertains to during the COVID lockdowns, you know, a lot of things were uh, administrators were asking staff to, to operate at all ungodly hours, basically, night and day, some meetings at 8 o'clock, some heads of departments meeting at 9 o'clock. And even today, you know, now that some, the, the COVID effect has abated a little bit, some people still want to continue with that sort of practice. 
So this is a, ma a major challenge for, for universities, not just for the university all over, and something that the universities have to look at. And then my final point, basically, that um, despite all of this, that it was also very stressful for staff. Um, and Susan mentioned all the different things that staff, staff are people, regular people, they have families and so forth. So even though we were providing training, counseling, all these different things, it still was a very stressful experience. And even now, we still have to continue with the counseling and, and continue the training. Um, I think basically, I just leave it there. Uh, Thank you. For now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn. For you, you've spoken of a number of issues, uh, including partnerships and financial sustainability. And, and one thing that, that, that strikes me as, as, as very important to, to recollect and as we try to transform higher education and higher education teaching is uh, to, to acknowledge the differentiated impact that different crises, environmental, for example, in the Caribbean, but also social, uh, and the COVID-19, a sanitary crisis as well, had a different, differentiated impact, for example, between countries in small uh, islands and development, developing states, but also within countries. And that speaks also of, uh, of the variety and of the diversity of realities that higher education institutions attend to, and the diversity that teachers in higher education also need to cater for. Let me turn now to uh, Mr. Jose eh, Castiano, uh, Vice Rector of the Universidad de Pedagogica de Maputo, a Mozambique. Um, uh, Jose, the, the COVID-19 crisis unveils important differences between public and private higher uh, education institutions, also differentiated impact among students and teachers from, div from diverse bi backgrounds. Now, given the diversification of higher education and looking into the future, what are the challenges for the democratization of higher education and what role can teachers play in it? Okay, thank you, Carlos. I, I just want to summarize uh, your question, the response to your question, in three main issues. Uh, but before I would say, we are no longer only in the time of rethinking the future. We are in the time of creating the future. So it sounds a bit different when you say we are creating the future. Teachers are the creators of the future. So in that sense, I think there are three main challenges that we're facing. One is that teacher's identity, has to do with teacher's identity. Where does it come from? First, it should be come from the well-trained, subject trained. I mean, the teacher has some subject, scientific area where he teaches, he must know what he teaches. Secondly, we lost, um, 50 years ago, we lost the tradition of teachers' association to fight for their rights. So we no longer have those because of new liberalism on those old system that was put in. So, so teacher identity is lost or social identity because of that. But I think also it should come from better payments and investment in education. Teachers creating the future, they should be the first defenders of education against the disinvestment that all our countries are suffering now. For instance, the budget for the university and the teacher training is sinking drastically. Uh, the second issue I think it's important is to think on the, this, uh, let's say, digital transformation and what does it mean for teacher training for the future. Um, I think teachers, they need support in infrastructures, not only in training, to create uh, or to enable a learning environment for the students, but also in infrastructure. So the pandemic, as you asked, it showed how far behind are teachers in term of in front of their students. I would say, as I'm from the philosophy, that the teachers 
we have uh, traditional teachers and postmodern students. And that is the striking part of this situation. And we, we have to support teachers. They should not run to buy airtime when the conference with, with from Barcelona or New York it is. That's that how it happens. So that is the, 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 the second issue. The third one is what you said. Uh, the democracy in Africa has shown how diverse or diverse we are from gender diversity, cultural diversity, political diversity. But the main diversity I think it has showed is social diversity. We have students who are, who are very, very, very poor and coming to high schools, to university. So that divide between rich and poor has grown. And even when we speak about diversity, we just think about gender, culture, political, but that diversity is the main one, I think. And it's a challenge to create the future. I read yesterday, no one should be left behind. So how do we do that when we don't invest in the diversity? So I think that were the main challenges I see. So summing up, identity, teacher's identity, then this digital divide that we have, and then what I spoke about, how to create uh, teachers who uh, create defenders of democracy. Teachers should be the defender of democracy, the first one in our country. Let me just sum up, say uh, we are celebrating the centenary of uh, Junior Signorere, De Mualimo. If he were alive, it would be 100 years now. So he was the, the one who put it together, what I said. He said, there is no development without education, self-reliance education. There is no development without democracy. You must free the energy of people through democratic ways. And I would add to him, there is no development with this digital divide that we have of teacher training. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. And, and, and to add to the, to the anniversary of uh, Julius Neyere, it's also the 100th anniversary of Paulo Freire's okay. uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And, and also to think about the pedagogy of hope, I think. I think that would be a very, a very good combination. And at the heart of it, and, and at the heart of what you mentioned as well, uh, in terms of the democratization of, of higher education, it's important to have hope. It's important um, to, but, but to, to recognize and to acknowledge diversity, uh, social diversity that is beginning to enter, if not fully yet, the classrooms and the faculties of higher education institutions. We want to assist to that transformation of, of higher education from the ivory tower to a, to a public, to a common good that actually advances society and that includes mm -hmm. um, all, all, all members, all, all ethnicities, all genders, and all um, um, social groups. On that note, let me turn to Ms. Keishia Thorpe, uh, Global Teacher Prize winner, uh, to, to continue talking about uh, probably, probably the diversity and the democratization of, of, um, of higher education, the representation of, of different uh, social groups in, in uh, higher education faculties is still somewhat limited. And, and the, the coming of uh, non-traditional first-generation students has also caused uh, uh, challenges in terms of how we open and, how, and what kind of supports teachers can provide to uh, disadvantaged learners. Now, Keishia, having experienced uh, discrimination and inequality in education yourself, you have mentored immigrant students from disadvantaged communities to access higher education. What advice would you give higher education teachers to support non-traditional and first-generation students and to education systems to improve the representation of social diversity in classrooms and faculties? Keishia. 
Uh, thank you so much for that question, and um, it is a pleasure to be a part of this panel. I know that we're talking about higher education, but I definitely think that my perspective is also as equally important because I'm a high school teacher who is preparing students to take that next step uh, to higher education, and a lot of time we see that students at this level become very discouraged because of all the challenges that college uh, go through internally, and also some of the challenges to access for themselves. So I'm going to start out by just saying, um, for myself, as a high school student in my native country of Jamaica, that's where I had my first experience with inequality in education, because I am also was one of those students who was considered economically disadvantaged. And like most people who grew up in poverty, I too dreamed of going to college and breaking that cycle. And I knew that graduating high school was not going to set me up for the kind of level of success that I wanted to have in order to accomplish my dreams. So when I graduated high school in Jamaica, there were more than about 30% of people that were below the poverty line, and the highest percentage of those were school-age students, which would have included myself. Um, so I understood early what the value of having a higher education would be. And fast forward, I earned a scholarship to a university in the, um, in the US. And as an international student, I too had many challenges navigating a new world and the pressures of really keeping up with my grades and my scholarship. Um, simple things like, Grammar and spelling made me score low in my English classes, uh, even though I was great at English in high school. Um, but because my professors did not care about the differences in our education system, so instead of being scored on my critical thinking skills, I find myself being heavily criticized and penalized for things like spelling and grammar. Um, I was even discriminated against because some of my professors at the time thought my accent was too thick. And other times, I, because I was simply black or I was an immigrant, um, and th some of those stigmas were also because of the political environment as well. Uh, and, but I had to learn how to adapt quickly, and I had to teach myself how to navigate those challenges, especially when I was in the classroom with professors that did not look like me. And I know we also, uh, briefly talked about representation, so I'll go more into that a little bit later. Um, and this, this, this that I just explained just was to give you a little bit of context about some of the challenges international students are up against when they think about higher education, and which is, can sometimes be very discouraging. Uh, so currently, I teach at the International High School Langley Park in Bladensburg, Maryland, in um, Prince George's County public school system. And the students that I teach are 100% immigrants uh, and refugees. They are also English language learners. And they, some of them are also first-generation American. And 98% of them cl are classified uh, or identified as low income. And they come from many different countries across the world and many different cultures and also represent many different religions. And so their identities already, when they come into the US, make them feel like they do not belong. And they struggle with language barriers, they struggle with social and cultural norms, fitting in and assimilating. And through high school, as a teacher, a 12th grade teacher, I'm one of those people who really try to help them to navigate this new world. But even though we try to make them college and career ready, there are still struggles that they have to overcome because we all know that high school is a lot different from college. And so my first-generation students, immigrants, refugees, students, international students, and even non-traditional students, like myself, uh, may not automatically be conversant to the norms of college because of the different backgrounds and learning experiences. And this, these students are also some of the hardest hit by the um, COVID pandemic and will also need additional support when they go to college. And especially with financial aid, and most likely because of their backgrounds, they also will need a lot of social emotional support. And because most of the students come from low-income backgrounds, they also must find a way to pay for college. 
um, because and at the same time they're taking care of their families and so funding for them and thinking about how they will pay for a higher education is very challenging. So when we think about how colleges can be a lot more flexible and how they can provide multiple learning options as a pathway to certification and degree for those uh, population of students is very important. Um, another issue that we face in college is representation, and we all know that representation matters. Even though we think of re representation and the impact from K-12 to education, a lot of time we do not think about the impact of representation in college, and I think it's equally as important because these college students are coming from a lot of diverse places, and our teacher force in colleges are not as diverse as we would like it to be, and so they're really behind in catching up on the diversity of, of representing the diversity of students that they teach. Um, this, is not, this is not just a problem with minority students um, feeling that they don't belong in the classroom, but also some of these colleges and college professors do not have updated curriculums, and we talked about pedagogies, right, and syllabuses to add courses that include and represent their student population. And this form of curriculum discrimination discourages students from pursuing certain disciplines in college and also limit their college options. And especially true for minority students and female students who especially want to enter um, into the STEM fields. So, there are ways that higher education teachers can really contribute to transforming education beyond the qualification of learners and develop an ethic of care and solidarity to instill a sense of belonging and responsibility for the world. So colleges may need, to, may need more overt guidance to help these students navigate parts of the system. Uh, professors, in particular, need to take into consideration the challenges of the postmodern students that we talked about earlier. Um, especially during this pandemic, they need to really figure out how they can support students. Uh, these professors as well also need to, um, they also need help from college administration because they can't do it by themselves. Uh, we talked about democratiz um, democratizing education, which I think is so important because students also have a lot to say. And um, they need colleges to listen to them because a lot of times they also have a lot of the solutions. Uh, we need to make more inclusive practices, um, a higher education priority so that all students feel a sense of belonging, include courses that represent students and their interests and identities, and increase representation in the teaching force, and create alternative pathways, especially now in, um, since we've had the pandemic and we realize the importance of that, and options for students who are non-traditional, immigrants and refugees and also international students. And international students were also some of the, uh, faced some of the most struggles when they actually had to leave campuses and go back to their different respective countries. And for some of them, learning actually had to stop. Um, and so this was a major, created a major crisis for a lot of students who had to feel like they had to start over. Um, I think during the pandemic also we saw a lot of efforts by professors to adapt to remote learning and often considerably at their own cost, time and energy. And this should actually really be recognized um, and acknowledged because they have put in a lot of work. However, professors do need to support and cater to the students that they serve, particularly for those whom the standard weekday class schedule is so unrealistic. Even those students who are still in the even though those students are still in the minority in terms of higher education enrollment, but their complex lives should still be recognized. And technology and more flexible ways of meeting and learning, um, meeting their learning challenges will be a part of this. In terms of promoting an ethic of care and solidarity, there needs to be a shift away from professors just being kind of almost seeming like the ultimate authority figure in a classroom that kind of wields their power, but instead more so of an informed facilitator of learning um, and discussion and investigation. And just moving away from that traditional way of teaching because this is not uh, applicable for our postmodern students today. 
and more widely, professors can encourage students to find broader connections between their course matter and the wider world of reading, living, and even thinking, and be more globally and culturally competent. Um, and because this goes a far way, especially for teaching international students. Uh, and finally, colleges should all strive to become global campuses um, and leaders of diversity and inclusion and leaders in preparing our students to be global citizens. Um, that way we can finally get to the place of trying to level that playing field in education and go back to at least get closer to where we think no child is left behind. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Keishia. Um, indeed, uh, quite, quite a lot of challenges when one thinks about the relevance of higher education and, and the role that higher education teaching personnel, that research and administrative personnel as well uh, can bring to, to, to change what you have mentioned in terms of uh, internally the pedagogies, the pathways, the organization of learning, the different ways of certification, uh, and, and outside the university as well, the relevance of a higher education institution in how it responds to societal problems, beginning with job market demands, but also with social issues, and the support that teachers need to actually attend to that in diverse contexts. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kishia. Um, now, let me, uh, we'll, we'll open the floor but, uh, before, uh, for, for comments, for questions that you may have. The, the next 30 minutes are dedicated to a conversation with the, with the participants. And to moderate that, we have my colleague, Mr. Oliver Liang from the International Labor Organization, who will be able to give you the floor also by a raise of hands, but I'm sure he has questions of his own uh, and, and to frame this, uh, this dialogue. So over to you, Oliver. Thanks very much, Carlos, and thanks everyone on this panel. I think this was really a very rich and interesting panel because it kind of went beyond a little bit what we heard yesterday. Yesterday, we heard a lot about how COVID has changed uh, higher education. I think today we went, as, as Susan said, you know, looked at some of these things that were already changing way before COVID. Um, I think, you know, what this discussion brought out is that higher education is not going to be the same. You're, you're dealing with students, the postmodern student, as Jose said, who are digital natives. They are going to want different pedagogies and different ways of learning that include a lot of digital technologies. They are demanding inclusion, inclusion that goes way beyond just gender and ethnic inclusion. It in involves neurodiversity inclusion. It involves disability inclusion. It involves, I think, and this was very important, also inclusion way of, of social status and social class, not only within the student body, but actually represented in the higher education staff who are still, to this day, uh, tend to be from one social economic status, uh, group only. This is a group that's wanting a decolonization of the curriculum. They want a decarbonization of the curriculum and perhaps even of the institutions that are delivering it. We have students that are working in a changing labor market. They are no longer preparing for lifelong careers in one job, but potentially preparing for multiple careers in highly interdisciplinary jobs. They're preparing for a life of lifelong learning, which on one hand seems to be a very uh, promising uh, idea of one of constantly being able to access learning, to adapt to new uh, changes and challenges. At the same time, it can also seem to be a kind of daunting task if one constantly has to buy education in order to remain employed, which reminds us, of course, that higher education remains a big business. And the privatization and business interests behind this are not negligible and drive this as well. And I think, um, as, as, as Glenford <laughs> reminded us, the neoliberal mindset that uh, came to being uh, many decades ago still pervades many, many ideas in higher education, that of uh, the atomization and competition between academics, that of those of rankings and neo-managerial schemes, those of the endless measurement of uh, academic achievement, however that may be. So I think you know, this panel really addressed some of these, these driving concerns. Uh, and what I think this audience can help us do is try to define what is indeed going to be the new social contract 
in higher education. Social contract, of course, at least in the Rousseauian sense, means what are people willing to give up? What obligations are they willing to take on? And in return for what protections and what rights? And I think she has already mentioned some of these. What are some of the new obligations that are going to come on to higher education personnel? Uh, learning new pedagogies, learning new cultural sensitivities, learning new ways of dealing with highly diverse students. I think these are certainly uh, pressures that are going to be put on um, uh, teachers today. But in return, what kinds of things can they expect? And I think Susan reminded us what you know, some of these key elements of decent work are. Being paid living wages, having uh, contractual security, having employment security, having autonomy, and of course um, having the freedom but also the culture that enables um, association of trade unionism and collective bargaining. So I think these are, these are potent, potentially some elements that could go into that. So maybe um, while the panel thinks about what this new social contract could be for higher education personnel, we can also get some of your questions in. Uh, I don't know if we have a microphone for, um, we do. is there, yes, we, we do have a floating microphone. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and please also just quickly say who you are and we'll bring it back to the panel. We have a question here from um, Madame Deca from, from, from Romania. So good morning, my name is Ligia Deca and I'm a presidential advisor on education and research in Romania and I've listened to the panel speaking very eloquently uh, regarding the, the challenges not just for higher education teachers but also for learners in general and how do they bridge the gap towards higher education. I have two questions stemming from um, the, the discourse um, from all panelists. One, you've mentioned flexible paths. And I'm wondering, um, because there has been a lot of talk about teacher shortages um, and, and how do we you know, keep uh, the, the, the quality of the teaching body while at the same time allowing for flexible learning paths. So how do these flexible learning paths look like in the future and how do we ensure both flexibility and a certain amount of standards uh, in order to benefit the learners? That's one. And my second question has to do with something that I know is not very popular, uh, but it's something that governments increasingly are pressured by the public to do, and that's evaluating teachers. How do we assess teachers according to added value for the learners in the future? We, we've tried to look at learning outcomes, um, and that you know is sketchy in terms of using it for assessing um, teachers, because they're not the only factor. But how do we assess teachers in a way that's fair and forward-looking? Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know who wants to take on those two very important questions. One on flexible paths to becoming teachers in the context of teacher shortages. Maybe there's a question right there, which is, are there, where are there teacher shortages in higher education? Because it's not the same situation as in, say, primary and secondary. And then on the evaluation of higher education <coughs> teachers. Glenford, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Well, on, on the question of flexible um, <laughs> learning for shortages and shortages of teachers, um, one of the things I think which has benefited the University of the West Indies over the years is the fact that we've been able to, to attract some of the very best professors um, globally. So now some of the most famous African um, professors actually spent a good set of years at the University of the West Indies also. But I think we have the, te the technology now, and I think COVID really accelerated this, this particular aspect, right, in the sense that we have the technology to be able to have lectures from wherever they are, faculty from wherever they are, to be able to teach in universities right across the, the globe. There's um, really no reason why uh, I, I, somebody in, in Austria, for example, could not be teaching um, students in the, in, in, the, in the University of the West Indies. Um, so you could also have that diversity of experiences for, for, for students. Um, now, the, assessing, uh, <laughs> the assessment of teachers now, I think, is um, sort of lagging 
um, behind the, the developments in, in, in the field. And that uh, teachers are, are being asked to do so many more things today. Um, more and more, more demands on them in, in every way that you could think about. Um, but we still have our traditional ways of, of assessing them. Um, I, I'm speaking now about tertiary, um, higher education. We still have all old, old systems. Um, a lot of the things, the extra effort, the extra work that they do, um, especially since COVID, is not necessarily recognized um, formally, formally within the, the assessment criteria and stuff. So I think that's one of the major challenges that we have to now do is to develop more appropriate um, ways of assessing teachers um, and, and, and also engaging in, in, in the development, of, um, professional development of, of teachers. Thank you. I, Susan, did you want to add to me? Um, yes, just uh, I think on the issue of assessment of teachers, um, I think we, well, I, I'd make two points. Um, in any, the development of any, um, uh, you know, methodology program around assessment of teachers, um, it must be done in the context of the support that teachers are provided. Um, and what we know, um, I, I think, is that, you know, teachers um, are not provided with the sort of support that we think is, is necessary for them to fill their, their roles, whether it be um, uh, you know, the provision of uh, pedagogy uh, training, pedagogical training, uh, whether it be around support in terms of remuneration, um, even the valuing of teachers. So if we actually set up uh, systems of assessing teachers without looking at that overall context, then uh, in fact, what will happen is that you more likely move to that sort of notion of learning outcomes, which is certainly not the way uh, of assessing teachers. So there must be, a, 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 you know, it considered as a holistic approach. What is the purpose of it? How do you actually engage the teaching profession in development of that, of, of that uh, appraisal process? And what is the support mechanisms that are provided um, along the way, uh, pre-teaching, uh, but also uh, during, uh, during uh, teachers' careers so that there is continuous, what we call pro continuous professional learning? I think that's a major uh, you know, you know, issue around it. It's sort of also linked to that notion of um, uh, teacher shortage, actually. We talk about teacher shortage uh, in higher education. You actually have to look at the conditions under which teachers perform their, their tasks. Talked a little bit about those already. But unless you address those underlying issues, we will continue to have a shortage of teachers. Mm. Thanks. I think. Uh, Jose, you wanted to add something, Kashia, yes. very quickly, perhaps on this issue of flexibility and assessment, and then yeah. okay. just on assessment, because on the flexibility, I don't know much, uh, but on assessment, what I think is that looking into future, into the future, the system of assessment should be self-assessment based, because we spend a lot of time filling forms responding to the questions that they not have to do with the subject we have to teach. And I think this system of assessment, it will not take long. We should invest more on self-assessment or group assessment. It means uh, if you have a group of students or of teachers and they own, uh, have had to develop some self-assessment criteria. Uh, last, lastly, I was amazed. I visited Finland uh, two months ago. They have uh, two no's. One no is they don't have uh, this uh, ranking system that the world is fighting for. Second, second no, no is that don't have, they don't have teacher assessment in that way that we mean they are more on the self-assessment system and it, it, it works. So I mean, on that issue, we should change also our mind, our modern mind from control knowledge to more of uh, autonomous knowledge. That would be my answer to that. Thanks, that's very, uh, I think a very useful direction. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to address the flexible pathway question, um, part of the question, so because of the diversity of our student population, colleges need to prov um, provide a lot more options and different pathways for students to be able to 
be successful in, um, in terms of what their ability to want to pursue higher education, a lot of time is discouraged because they don't find it necessary. For example, immigrant students, uh, they're mostly English language learners, and it takes seven years to acquire the knowledge. Most of them, say for example in the US, they come in some parts of high school, and high school we know is four years, so they're already halfway up, up, off the mark of that seven year. So by the time they graduate, they'll never acquire the language, most of them, to a native perspective where they can really take on the rigor of college, and we know College mostly is academic, um, and they're not able to take on that rigor. And so colleges should find other pathways for those students who want to be successful. We're thinking about no child left behind, right? If we're not providing options for those students to upskill themselves and to prepare for the workforce, then we are like, leaving people behind, right? So we need to figure out what are some of those career technical courses that students, for example, uh, in high school, that have been doing and take some of those, move them into the college level where they can have a higher level of training in those fields so that they can be more productive in the economy and in the workforce. So they can actually join the workforce and not join it at the bottom and struggle to climb the ladder, but because they have the desire to have a higher level of education and enter the workforce at a higher level, they should be provided the opportunity to do so, and colleges should think about that. Yeah, Carlos, did you want to say something? Yeah, just, just uh, something to go back to the, to the issue of, of assessment, which I think that has been already uh, very well uh, reflected upon. But just, to, just, just maybe one comment around uh, the, the transformation of education and, and, and how we look at the future of education as a collaborative profession. So I think it is very important in, in transforming education, the new social contract for education proposed by the Futures of Education report is a move from the individual achievement mm -hmm. to the collective work of communities of practice, of communities of reflection around one's own performance, like Jose was mentioning, the, the self-assessment, but assessment needs to move also in this direction. It should be collective. And it should be the very purpose of, of, of assessment is, is the improvement of teaching practice mm -hmm. and, the, and the relevance of teaching practice. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, I believe that that, that can only be possible when one enters into conversation, one reflects on their own practice and can put it into play with others. So just to say, this issue of, of, and I think we, we see today the fear of assessment, has to do with this imaginary of meritocracy, of individual achievement, as, as if teaching was an individual profession, when it is a relational profession by nature. So this, this, this fear of assessment has to do with the individuality of being judged against certain, uh, you know, certain parameters, and that there might be sanctions for the work that we do or that we don't do. So I think we need to do away with the idea of uh, an assessment that is punitive, that it is uh, to sanction, that it is to, uh, to pressure academicians to publish in top journals, to travel to the most conferences. And these metrics of education is the ones that we need to do away with. Mm -hmm. So a more collective approach to education, a more collaborative fashion will also yield to more collaborative ways of assessing who we are as teachers, what we do as faculties, mm -hmm. and the effect that we can actually have on society. Thank Thanks, Carlos. Yeah, and you raised the issue of also how do you judge or how do you appreciate research versus teaching, which is probably going to play this as well. Um, we have other questions, and maybe we'll, we'll do this round a bit faster and, and try to um, give a little bit more time also for some other questions. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Alfred Mwanza from uh, Kwame Nkrumah University in Zambia. I think that uh, listening from the conversation from yesterday and today as well, um, hearing a lot of challenges uh, that are faced both by students as well as uh, the teachers or the lecturers in these institutions. My concern or 
probably what I've not heard is the, the issue regarding this uh, differently abled lecturers and students because the impact actually of COVID-19 has been severe on this group of students and lecturers. And some of these students, when they come to universities, they have got other expectations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they feel like they want to do skill training, maybe even the sciences, even engineering. But we face, we face a lot of challenges in terms of infrastructure, in terms of equipment, and such that when this group of students come, they get disappointed, and sometimes they leave university, and sometimes they are forced to change from what they aspire to do in the sciences and to social sciences. Don't know what probably UNESCO come to assist our institutions in the aspects of infrastructure and equipment so that this group of students are not left behind. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, yes, the very tough question about infrastructure and uh, how to get that, but not only how to get it, but to keep it functioning, the sustainability behind it. Mm -hmm. And um, making sure that it stays in, in the hands of, of the universities and not into the hands of private companies. Those are challenges. I don't know if anyone wants to take on that challenge. It's not... Uh, Well, well, maybe I'll just make one short comment. I mean, this does go to the, it really does go to the funding model, the funding models we have for universities, actually, and the, um, the fact that the existing funding models don't work, um, causing increasing privatisation. So what should be, you know, publicly, pu publicly owned, uh, you know, infrastructure, um, you know, used for the public good, provision uh, for the public good, uh, often can there, therefore be moved into private hands and, and we lose it. So I think, you know, und underlying that it go goes to government responsibilities in relation to funding of, of higher education and the rejection of the funding model that actually leads to privatisation. Okay, I mean, it's, it's clear that, you know, governments have a role here, um, but public-private partnerships probably do too, and the question is how to keep those uh, in, in, in such a way that the governance of them still remains in public hands. And I'm wondering whether or not university partnerships can play a role here too. I mean, um, Western universities do also have obligations vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, I think, other universities uh, to, to, to provide investments and create partnerships, and I think that might be, could also be a, a way. Did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah I just want to say, our position at the University of West Indies is, um, in, in response, because remember, we, we're just coming out of the, <laughs> a severe global financial crisis, and then COVID just made things so much worse, right? But the university's position, our position basically, and this is um, a, a direct quote from our vice, current vice chancellor, um, it's a program of systemic change and transformation. It's a partnership model in which academic leadership will partner progressively with owners of private capital with development goodwill and with, glo with the global community, with a consciousness of commitment to the advancement of the Caribbean. The for-profit element will not engage predator private wealth owners, but will seek out and work with ethical development investors and those committed to Caribbean and nation building. In other words, we're not just going to just uh, take on anybody um, just because they come with a lot of money and able to throw cash at the university and in return, they basically got the values of the university and reshaped the university in an image which in the, eventually, in the long term, will be to the detriment of the university. So I think every institution will have to figure out for itself um, 
how it is going to go about engaging um, the private sector. Everybody says, go to the private sector, go to the private sector. But we know that a lot of the, the people who have the money in the private sector um, operate in a very cannibalistic type of ways, right? So you may get some money to do some things, but the long-term impact on your institution could be very severe. Thanks for that. That's, I think, a great point. We have another question from a gentleman here. Could we get the microphone to him? Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for all your contributions. I'm Andreas Keller from the German Trade Union for Education and Research. I'm representing as well the, um, the European region of Education International. You were talking a lot about um, the more and more diverse student population and the challenges for teachers to support, to encourage, to empower uh, students. Um, uh, disadvantaged students, diverse students. Um, on the other hand, um, teachers are as well role models for the students. So how could we manage to make also the teachers, teacher body more diverse, um, that the teachers um, reflect in uh, the diversity of the whole um, so population? Um, so we should talk about access to academic careers, hurdles in order to get um, permanent positions, professorships there. Um, I wonder if you have some ideas how to manage this and um, solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a really important question. And I'm already looking to Kashia because you, you look like you've got some ideas. Yes. Um, of course, you know, as a minority teacher in the U.S., I think um, there are a lot of things that, not just colleges, I mean, it starts at the bottom. Uh, when we think about high schools, when we, when we, particularly, because my students are 12th graders, when we put them on the stage right before graduation and they're, um, we're asking them, what they're, they're introducing themselves, um, what university they're going to and what they're going to be studying. We rarely find one or two students that even want to be teachers. And this is a stigma because of how we look at teachers in our society. We do not place a lot of value on teachers and this is shown in many aspects in how, you know, in how they speak about us, uh, in our collective bargaining process, in um, funding, funding for schools, funding even scholarships for teachers. We'll find a lot more, today we find a lot more scholarships being given in the STEM field before there are even scholarships for teachers. Um, colleges, of course, have also been on, I think there has been a small increase in, in uh, in the teach in, in, in students wanting to go to uh, college to pursue teaching degrees. And even with that, we have, uh, it's still not looked on as, <coughs> well, I'll say this. The students that are actually going into college to pursue, uh, and this is uh, what research found as well, the students who are going into college to pursue um, a higher, um, a teaching degree are not necessarily the students who are um, from higher socioeconomic background. They're usually those at the bottom. So that already, already also put another stigma on the teaching profession because we are classifying teachers as at the bottom because these are the students that typically will want to pursue teaching careers. And so when we think about it from a higher education perspective, getting into some of those teaching colleges are, is also getting into a really good um, teaching program in college is also very challenging because students of color who don't have the finances are not supported to get into those programs as well. Um, and also the large student debt, we're thinking, okay, well, if I become a teacher and I'm a minority and, I'm, and I get out of college, this debt will linger over my head forever and I will never get to pay it back. So there's really a lot of different challenges. The, the assessment to go into those teaching programs um, sometimes are a lot very biased as well, um, as most people 
would, um, you know, it's a controversial issue, but they would say that those, uh, those assessments are biased as well. And it discourages a lot of teachers. Um, there are not a lot of um, support either. So some, some solutions would be really to figure out how, how districts, school districts, um, hire and retain teachers of color. What, how do they incentivize uh, teachers as well uh, to go into higher education? Um, to represent that population of students. And colleges definitely need to do more in terms of who they give tenures to. You know, there are not of a lot of teachers of color that gets tenure. They get to be the adjunct and the associate professors. Um, so, you know, those are different things that they need to look into as well. No, thank you. I think that's, that, that point is very key because the transition from graduate school to actually full professorship mm -hmm. goes through a kind of, at least in the United States, through a long series mm -hmm. of very lowly paid adjunct professorships and so forth. And I certainly, my recollection from my grad school days is the people who could survive that tended to be people who had the means uh, mm -hmm. and, and the parents who could sort of uh, support that kind of lifestyle <laughs> for, for <laughs> sometimes several years. Um, I'm sure we, we have very little time, but perhaps Jose and then Susan, if you want to just add something quickly. Okay, just a few, few words, uh, Oliver. Uh, uh, Mozambique, where I come from, has invested a lot in girls' education. Uh, so far that at my university, it used to be the most diverse group, girls and women. Uh, at my university, we had last year uh, 56 of the students are girls, higher school, at the university. That's a big, big investment that we had. And so far that I have colleagues here, they are all women. They are vice, deputy vice chancellor uh, from Eduardo Mugliani. There are three, and I'm alone as a man. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, you're up on stage. There is another serious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I'm on stage. Uh, but another, seriously, uh, we, it is a, a, a um, research field how content-wise that diversity can be uh, removed. Uh, for instance, we have observed that when you form a group of students and three are men, two are girls, and they are given tasks, the girls, they just speak about soft issues like introduction and resume, but the hard things are only men. So we tried also to, to change that, that no, 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 no. The hard stuff should be spoken by women too. It's not just introduction and then resume. So there are challenges in the research. It's not only to bring girls to the higher education, but also to, to see how uh, content-wise they are accompanied. But my last point is I want to go back to infrastructure. And I think the UNESCO, if could help us to remove some regular or legal issues that impede that we have infrastructure. For, for instance, this, uh, how do you call it? Um, it's called, I wrote it somewhere here, uh, the um, procurement system. Instead of fighting corruption, is, is enriching the corrupt. And it's, it's insane. I mean, so, mm -hmm. so they should be removed and think for the future other ways mm -hmm. of, uh, um, um, let's say, financing infrastructure. That's what can be done, I think so, done, I think so. Another thing is what you said, uh, Western universities, they have also responsibility to help us with uh, infrastructure. It means I don't say they should send uh, things, but also help in, uh, in fighting for investment, more investment in education, you know? and through the collaborative projects to see how the issue of, of infrastructure uh, in the form with, uh, let's say, computers and other things can be this gap, what I talked about, uh, 
the digital gap can be removed. Okay, we're, we're out of time, but maybe if, if you wanted to say the, the one la last thing on, on diversity. Yeah, yeah thanks, Oliver. Uh, it's, a, it's a great point I think you make, uh, Andreas. Um, we must address the issue of diversity amongst our teaching and research staff in higher education. Um, you know, the points that have been made, you know, the students must be able to see in their, in their higher education um, staff um, a representation of, of society, a representation of the, of the community that, uh, that, that they face. And I think that the point that has been made about the undervaluing of the teaching profession is critical in this. There are a number of ways. We must make it more attractive. We must you know, move from that notion that you only move within higher education, that you only promote if you research rather than teach, because teaching itself is is undervalued by that, by, by that recognition. We must provide the support. We must actually move away from a casualised uh, uh, casualized, uh, 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 teaching force as well. All of those things have to be addressed if we're going to make it an attractive profession and then, uh, and then get more, more into it and greater diversity, which is really critical. Thanks very much. Okay, Carlos, over to you to wrap it up. <laughs> Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver. Very little time to, to wrap up. I think uh, we have one last question. If ah, everybody's okay. in agreement, we can extend for three minutes so uh, we can uh, hear. I promise I'm going to be very question. quick. It's a very simple Please question. Please go ahead. Um, uh, Robin, SADC Secretariat. Um, just one question. Um, we've been talking about teachers, the role of teachers evolving. Um, but at the level of UNESCO, because UNESCO is, I know, one of the core players in terms of teacher development. But at the level of UNESCO, has this conversation about reimagining the future, has it started? Oh, but if it has started, is it only at, uh, within the realm of UNESCO, or is it also happening um, at national level, community-based approach? Because I think it's extremely important to actually engage with different players, uh, especially at national level, because the context is very different. Um, so has this type of self-reflection, but also discussion or conversation started at the level of UNESCO? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I think that helps me in, in wrapping up precisely <laughs> on, 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 on what, are the, what is the, the, the current work that we're doing at UNESCO uh, in, in reimagining the future of education. So indeed, just to, to, to wrap up the panel and to answer the question, I'd like to say that, as we said, we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of uh, UNESCO's recommendation concerning the status of higher education teaching personnel, which is something important that sets the rights, the obligations, but also the support that teachers need in order to help in that transformation of, of, of education. So I will not, I will not repeat the, 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 because I cannot, but the, the many, the many uh, voices we've heard today and the many issues around how to rethink education. In terms of process, uh, you know, the, the Futures of Education report was published in November last year. It was the fruit of, of many consultations. But now, as we move into September 2022, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations has convened the Transforming Education Summit, which is being coordinated by UNESCO. One of which action tracks is on teachers, teaching, and the teaching profession. Uh, and, and we're very happy from the International Task Force on Teachers for Education 2030 to co-lead with Romania, with uh, Ligia, who is here, with Nigeria, and with a set of, thank you very much for joining us, and <laughs> with a set of, um, of uh, stakeholders. Now, we have, the, the process is as follows. We have produced a discussion paper that will be put to consultation, so there will be consultations actually beginning next Tuesday. Uh, and running on up to September, where we will have, the, at the, in, the, in the frame of the United Nations General Assembly, there will be the, the Transforming Education Summit. Now, forms of engagement, there's many. One of them is looking at what are the issues that are being recollected as the most important, as the more challenging and pressing to transform the teaching profession and to provide input by means of looking at and, and, and providing written comment to the paper on the one hand, but secondly, we're looking at uh, effective, good, promising practices in terms of policies, in terms of programs that address the very issues that we've heard today in the panel. Issues around teacher shortages, issues around representation and diversity, 
issues around the qualification and the new pedagogies and the flexibility of qualification frameworks and pathways, um, issues around the working conditions uh, of teachers, the social standing of the profession, and ultimately the leadership and the innovation that teachers play in recasting education. So this is a little bit of the way forward. I will not bore you with details. Uh, we, we do have a pre-summit planned in Paris at UNESCO headquarters at the end of June, where there will also be discussion. And this is, again, a global conversation. So the input of different stakeholders from teacher unions to academicians, to activists, uh, to, to teachers and the students themselves is something that we're taking into consideration. So just to, to, to wrap up with that and to thank, to thank our panelists and, and the ILO as well for, for the moderation. And thanks to all of you for the conversation. We look forward to your engagement in the transformation of the teaching profession. Have a good day. Thank you very much.